I have 115. <clears throat> so let's start by just reminding people of the quiz this week. Um, I sent you guys an email about that, didn't I? I think we said we were going to have the quiz be over chapter 14 for, for this week. Is that what you guys have? Yeah. And then next week, note that the 11th is not a Thursday. It's a Tuesday. Normally, we have our quizzes on Thursdays, right? But in order to, to fit in those um, was it 10 quizzes? Yeah. And the, and the last exam is on that Thursday, the 13th. We had to, to pull up that, uh, that day, that time a little bit, that date, I should say. So um, I guess we could talk about um, the last quiz on the 11th and, and maybe have that be over a couple sections of 15, not the whole chapter. Um, so let's see how many sections we got in 15. I think maybe five. Yeah, five that we're gonna we're gonna cover. There's actually six sections. We're not gonna do the last section. Um, so um, just looking through the chapter real quick. Let's have the quiz on the 11th be over um, sections 15.1 two, and three. All right. Everybody heard me say that, right? Okay. Um, Of course, last week we had the third exam, and um, I think I mentioned also in that same email that this um, last exam was worth uh, 80 points instead of the regular 90 um, because we didn't put any essays on it. So the uh, the fourth exam will be worth 100 to make up the difference. Um, And that will um, be over chapters 13, 14, and 15. Okay. Um, on the syllabus, I noticed that it mentioned um, you dropped the two lowest quiz grades. Is that still a thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, yep. We dropped, we have 10 quizzes. We dropped the two lowest for a total of uh, 40 lecture quiz points. Yeah. Right. So Hannah's just referring to the syllabus there for those of you that are wondering. Yeah. Correct. Um, I've also been putting on extra credit points, as you know, on um, some of these quizzes and so forth and so on. Um, in other words, some of you who've had me for a &P, for example, I do an extra credit research paper. Um, in micro, we don't have a paper as an option, but I, I put on a um, corresponding number of extra credit points so that it would be like providing that opportunity for you. But instead of doing the paper, you've got the opportunity to earn some points on, on some extra quiz questions. Okay. So, all right. Um, I'm not sure where you guys are in terms of chapter 
13 or 14 or if you're still working on uh, 13, but I really want to stress the importance of staying on the schedule as best you can. I know you had the test last week. Uh, I, I you know, know you were focusing on 10, 11, and 12, but do not be waiting until the last minute to do 14 and 15, especially I'd say 15. Um, these two chapters, as you know, um, both cover uh, immunity and in a and one you've all had that, I know, um, whether you took it at JCC or elsewhere, um, you should have had some exposure to the lymphatic system and some basic concepts regarding immunity. And so that's why I suggested in that email or a recent email that if you still have your A&P notes, that it wouldn't be a bad idea to go back and just maybe look through those even before you start to look at chapters 14 and 15. I think that would be a really great way to kind of get rid of those cobwebs that have been there for maybe a year or more since you've had A&P. Of course, the bigger question is, do you guys save your A&P notebooks? Or do you like burn them in the fireplace the day after the final? Does anybody save their A&P notes? Put a, give me a thumbs up. Do you really up want or, to know the answer? <laughs> huh? Do you really want to know the answer? I, I, I do. I want to know. I want you to be honest. I actually think I still have them, but I was just about to burn them like shortly. <laughs> so perfect timing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's for times like, like this where it might be nice. Or, you know, when you guys take your NCLEX, NCLEX, what do they call them? Um, you know, just to brush up on some basic A&P in preparation for, for an exam that you might, accreditation exam, you know, it, it might be nice to have those. So wait until you pass your NCLEX, then Juliana, big, we're going to Juliana's house, big bonfire, burn all the micro and A&P notebooks. Yeah. Um, oh, you're not taking A&P until the fall. So you've had principles of bio already then? Yeah, I took um, the bio class here to um, We have a, as a prerequisite for um, micro at JCC. It was like one or the other that you could have taken the prerequisite. You took principles of bio? Yeah. Where at, here? No, at Bonaventure. At Bonas. So Hannah, you haven't had any anatomy and physiology at all. Oh my god! Taking that next year. Yes. Oh, you're right. There, there is either prerequisite. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm going to be brutally honest with you. You're going to be a little bit of a disadvantage uh, to some of the students because, you know, they've had that that particular organ system lymphatic that talks about some of these concepts and. Um, and, and this gets a little, um, this is a little bit challenging, I, I, would, I would say. Um, the immunity gets to be a little bit technical to, in, to some extent. Not something you can't deal with, Hannah, though I know. But, but it's gonna be all new, so it could be a little overwhelming. And if you've gotten into chapter 14, which I suspect you have, um, how did that go? I mean, is, is it okay? Is it kind of confusing? I actually just finished 13 today, so I was going to get it 14 <laughs> later today. Okay, okay, yeah. Not a problem. Um, I hope you're also looking at those Zoom lectures I recorded last spring. Um, I know, as I said, you've got those students listed there on the right-hand part of the screen as you watch the video, but um, do make use of those uh, Zoom lectures, you know. Um, so as I've always done, I think I'll just open up, open up the floor and just see if anybody has gotten into um, 15 at all, um, or 14, excuse me, the first of the two uh, immune system host defense chapters, I guess. Has anybody started 14 yet? I finished 14 today. Okay. I finished 14 today also. All right, great. I'm not, I'm not trying to shame you if you haven't, because I, I get, you know, 
you're busy and all that. Um, so I reviewed the lecture that you had posted like right before coming here. Um, I had a question, I guess, because I don't remember at all. Um, you were talking about salt, galt, and malt. Yeah. And I don't remember that at all from AMP. So yeah, yeah, that's a that's a good and fair question that Julianne asks. <clears throat> There's just a small reference to this tissue. It's it's considered. Uh, uh, let's see what's the proper technical word associated lymphatic tissue when we think of the lymphatic system of course we think of lymph nodes primarily right as being part of the of the lymphatic system but what are some other organs that we also talked about in a and p when you think of lymphatic system are there other organs you think of we'll get to this galt malt stuff in just a minute juliana What's, what's, what's um, just above your heart, there's a little gland that shrinks as you get older. The thymus. Thymus gland, right. So thymus gland, um, spleen is also a lymphatic organ. We think of the spleen as a, a filter of blood uh, and, it, and it certainly helps to do that. Um, but it also filters the blood of potential pathogens because in the spleen live different kinds of white blood cells that are very important in identifying and phagocytizing, killing microbes, right? Or, or cancer cells, you know, things of that sort, things that would cause us, us injury. So what Juliana was talking about was the fact she never heard of, of malt or galt. And as I said a moment ago, these are considered associated lymphatic tissues. And all you need to know really about them is that they are a little more widespread in the body. And um, the MALT, M-A-L-T acronym stands for mucosal associated lymphoid tissue. And so we find it in the gastrointestinal tract, so digestive system. We find it in the respiratory tract. We find it in the urinary system. Um, there are even additional subdivisions below and within this MALT um, uh, system, if you will. And all you got to really know is that in these different, um, more widespread tissues are lymphocytes, okay, which are a type of white cell. And they are there to help protect us from pathogens. Um, as you'll be learning about, B lymphocytes produce antibodies against the antigenic uh, pathogen while T cells or T lymphocytes play a more um, hands-on role in fighting infection. What, what I often think about or the way I describe the lymphatic system in A&P, and maybe this will be helpful for you guys too, um, especially for Hannah, for example, who hasn't had A&P before. When we think of these two important cells, the B cells and the T cells, they're both lymphocytes. Um, we think of the B cells in uh, their role in producing chemicals called antibodies. So you know how uh, when there's a war being fought, there's the artillery with the big guns that are, you know, 10, 20 miles behind the front where the action is, and they're shooting these missiles, these big shells to fall on the enemy side. Okay, this is kind of a silly analogy, but maybe it'll help. So they don't actually maybe see the enemy, but they're firing these missiles. Well, the B cells are firing, if you will, secreting antibodies. And those antibodies can combine with the enemy, i.e. pathogenic cell, bacterium, virus, uh, infected cell, whatever it might be, and knock it out. The T lymphocyte is like the infantry. Um, if you've ever studied or heard about World War I trench warfare, you know, where the Germans were, you know, on one side and the French were on the other side and there was literally a hundred yards between the two and, and they would uh, often, uh, you, you know, the old, 
the old scene in the movies is they, they, hear, they hear a whistle blow, and that would be the signal for everybody to get up out of their trench and to charge the other side, right? And then the bloodbath would begin, right? The machine guns and all that stuff. All right. Well, the infantryman with the fixed bayonet ready to stab the enemy is the T cell, because the T cell actually gets right up there and touches the pathogen and can, can knock it out in a different a number of different ways, one of which is just to secrete chemicals to kill it or to phagocytize it. So it's hand-to-hand -hand combat, if you will. Just think, of, just think of the T flipped over. It's kind of like a sharp object. I don't know. Yeah, I like that. That's a very good way to remember that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so if you started to read chapter 14, what it focuses on, as is indicated in the title, are innate defense mechanisms. What do we mean by innate? Anybody know what innate means? Innate. Is that like what you're born with? Yeah. That's a good way to think of it. What you're born with. It's determined by your genetics. It's determined by evolution. Uh, what it also means is that regardless of what the pathogen is or how many times you've been exposed to that pathogen, that these defense systems are up and ready to work for you. Does it make any difference how many times or what the invader is? Innate defenses are there to protect you against um, most all types of pathogens. Well, what would be a real obvious innate defense that you can think of that you have at your disposal that would prevent, let's say, entry of a pathogen into the body? That would be a defense, wouldn't it? Sure. Well, what am I talking about? What's the most obvious? Skin. Right. Skin. Exactly. Your integumentary system, right? One of the functions that we talk about in the integumentary system is protection. Even though your epidermis is less than a millimeter in, in thickness, it is very effective in preventing bacteria from getting in. Now, can they get in? Sure. Get a cut um, is a good example of how things can get in and fester and cause an infection or, or maybe other more serious issues, depending upon what's going on. Um, uh, we talk uh, also about the ciliated cells that line our trachea and upper respiratory tract and the mucus that's produced by the goblet cells. Well, the mucus is there to, of course, trap any potential airborne pathogens, and the cilia are there to move that mucus upward where you either spit it out or more than likely do what to it? Swallow it. Right, exactly. And you're swallowing it and tossing it into that pH 2 stomach, which is going to knock out 90% of pathogens. Just the acidity is just so low. Uh, pH, rather, is so low. The acidity is so high that it kills them. Now, there are some bacteria that love it in that stomach, right? Uh, Helicobacter is one particular uh, genus, anyway, that, that loves it acidic. But the vast majority are knocked out. So that's an innate defense. Skin, mucous membranes, the cilia, this, the acidity of the stomach, right? These are all really good examples of innate immunities. Even though I, would, I usually think of the term immunity as, um, as described in chapter 15. They, they use the term immunity in chapter 14, but I, um, I don't know. I, I think of immunity as being specific immunity, but they, they call it an innate. So fine, we'll call it an innate. Inborn, always there to help you no matter how many times you've been attacked or what is attacking you. So that's really what the first part of the chapter talks about. You know, physical and anatomical barriers, chemical barriers. Also the, the, the fact that we have um, inborn protection to many pathogens that might cause our cat or our dog or our horse to get sick. It's called species specific protection. So what might cause your cat to, to get sick, you 
if you're exposed to that same pathogen, you're not going to get sick because um, that pathogen hasn't developed a relationship with humans. It's developed a relationship with your cat or whatever animal you're talking about. That doesn't mean that some bugs or microbes can't affect both cats and, and humans or that bugs can't jump from swine to humans. They do. We, we talked about that in one of the earlier chapters. That's the primary way in which many flu viruses get transmitted from animals to people. And you know, where do we think the AIDS virus started? Well, we think it started in primates in Africa. Where do we suspect perhaps COVID-19 may have started? We're not sure, but may have started. Do you know what animal? Bats. Bats, right, very good. So nothing is black and white, there's, there's gray, but the fact is you are provided some innate protection just based upon your genetics, the fact that you're homo sapiens. And that, that provides you with some protection. So that's sort of what chapter 14 talks about. It kind of goes through um, those various innate defense systems. And it does a, a, a good job reviewing a lot about blood, the white blood cells, the five types of white cells, which again, for some of you is going to be new information. Um, You'll have to uh, pardon my slides that says review stamped on the slide because um, most of the people that take micro, not all, but mm, I'd say 90% have had A&P prior. But um, you're right, the prereq is either principles or A&P1. Um, would have been nice to have had A&P1 before, but it's not like you can't do well learning this stuff. It's just going to be a little more new to you, I guess. Um, so again, let me just open up the floor. Are, are there any things like you've been studying that you'd like to talk about? I have questions. Okay. Um, as far as, I mean, there's a couple things in chapter 14 that are super in detail. Yeah. Um, like the complement system for one. Yeah. Um, and then that video on the toll-like receptors. Are we going to have to know all those details and specifics? Um, the answer is no. Um, let's go to the to the PowerPoint, and I'll answer those questions. And those are excellent questions. She brought up the the complement. I'm I'm still a little iffy on like the whole concept of that. When we go to it, can you explain that a little bit better to me? Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, that's okay. what I was hoping for because, like I said, it's it's very detailed and involved. Yeah, so yeah, 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 yeah it is. You're, you're exactly right. Um, and I'm, I'm looking at the chat here. Carolina's got some questions about diapodesis and chemotaxis. Our interferons only produce for certain viruses and inhibition of cancer genes. Um, in terms of interferons, yes, they, they generally are produced to target virally infected cells and cancer cells. Um, the diapodesis process is the process by which white cells move out of the circulatory system into the tissues. And that's going to happen at the capillary level because if in a capillary, you have just the single um, squamous cell that makes up the wall of the capillary itself. The, the, the lumen is where the blood's flowing, but the cells that make up that capillary are simple squamous cells. So the best place to get out into the, from the bloodstream into the tissues is by squeezing in between two simple squamous cells in the, that make up the wall of the capillary. Um, chemotaxis simply means to move because of the presence of a chemical. So many uh, white cells exhibit what's referred to as positive chemotaxis. In other words, when you have an infection or an injury, sometimes injured tissue will, will produce chemicals. And some of those chemicals are there to attract phagocytic white cells to that injury site where there presumably are microorganisms that could have caused or could cause infection, right? So here's another silly analogy or metaphor that I think of when I think of chemotaxis. I think of if I'm out on the ocean on a fishing charter and I want to catch sharks, how could I best do that? 
again, you're thinking, why am I asking such silly questions? Yeah, Sarah's exactly right. Chum the water. And uh, what I would probably do is I have a bunch of, of uh, you know, bait fish that I would chop up and I pour that over the side of the, of the boat, a, a big uh, mash of stinky, smelly, chopped up fish. And that's going to attract the shark. They're going to they're going to sense that chemical in the water. They have very acute sense of of smell, and that's going to lead them to the ship. And then I'm going to take a big mackerel. I'm going to put on a big hook, and I'm going to cast it out and hope that I catch the shark. All right. So here the the body is chumming <laughs> the um, the injury site, if you will, with chemicals, and that can attract white cells to leave the blood, i.e. diapedesis, and move toward that chemical, i.e. chemotaxis. So positive meaning moving toward the chemical. Plants are positively phototactic. What does that mean? It means if you put a, a plant on, your, on the shelf of your window, it's going to bend toward the light, right? Positive phototaxis because of photosynthesis. Um, trout are positively rheotactic. That means that when fish are in the water on a stream, they face upstream. Why would you face upstream? Because that's where the food's coming from. Okay. So let's uh, again fire up the the uh, PowerPoint. So Carolina, I hope that helped. Is there just one quick question about that? Is there specific examples of chemicals? Um, when it comes to that, because I looked for that and it didn't really say much. Yeah, chapter 15. Okay. They're called, they're called cytokines. Okay. Yeah, that's coming up. Yep. All right. So, chapter 14. All right, everybody see chapter 14? Um, so the question was um, complement and, and what else? Oh, the toll like receptors, right? Sorry, I had to get to my microphone button. Um, the complement system, yeah. like the complement proteins, how much of that we right. have to know? Yeah, and, and then the toll-like toll receptors to the video for that was super detailed. Yes, yes. Okay, so let's take a look at this um, this slide that precedes the toll-like receptor video. Um, you have to understand this slide before you can understand how toll-like receptors work. And this this is really not a difficult concept to understand. So let's just take a moment and, and talk about what's going on. So here we've got. You all see the slide? Yes? Yes. OK. So here we've got a blood capillary right here. And here we see some white cells undergoing diapedesis. OK? Notice they're squeezing in between the simple squamous cells that make up the wall of this blood vessel. If this had been an artery or a vein, we would have had additional layers of connective tissue out from the innermost layer, which we don't have. OK, that's why blood cells are going to leave the bloodstream at the capillary level. They can't leave an artery or a vein. There's too much tissue to get through, basically. OK, so here's, here's some white cells, um, neutrophils and lymphocytes and eosinophils. Uh, those three are very good at leaving the blood and going out and trying to neutralize the pathogen 
again, when I say pathogen, I hope you're thinking bacterium, virally infected cell, um, uh, plasmodium, trypanosoma, right? And perhaps a, uh, a eukaryotic disease causing entity that we talked about in lab, right? A couple of weeks, months ago. So here we've got a couple of white blood cells shown here in purple and here's one in pink and this guy as well. Um, and here we have a bacterial cell. And on the surface of this bacterial cell are things called pathogen associated molecular patterns, also denoted of course in the box here, or PAMPs for short. Camps. But they are exactly what they say they are. They are molecules that are associated with pathogens. And guess what our white blood cell can do? They can recognize PAMPs. How do they recognize PAMPs? Because they have special receptor sites that can engage, physically contact the PAMP. So it's a it's a it's a receptor, protein receptor interaction thing. And I liken PRRs, pathogen recognition receptors, as the eyes of the, the cells. We use our eyes to recognize our friends, our neighbors, the uh, steering wheel of our car we're going to be manipulating as we drive home. I mean, right, we use our eyes. Uh, 80, 90 percent of our senses comes through our eyes probably. Right? Imagine if you didn't have your eyes. Wow. You'd compensate in other ways. You'd rely on your sense of hearing much more than you are now, right? But for a white blood cell, these are the eyes of the white cell. They use these surface receptors to identify not just bacteria like this that has PAMPs on it, but here's a white cell that's recognizing another white blood cell, perhaps, or a, a body cell of some sort, whose molecules identify this cell as a cell that belongs there. It's a body cell. It's what we call a self cell, self cell. We would define this bacterium in an immunological sort of way as a non-self cell, one that needs to be, number one, identified as non-self, and number two, let's get rid of it, neutralize it, kill it, okay? And so the way in which our immune system recognizes self from non-self is through these receptor um, structures on, on their surface. Yeah, it's pretty cool. We're good with that concept? Yeah. Okay. Yes, thank you. When we talk about toll-like receptors, these are examples of PRRs. Okay. These particular toll-like, and I, I'm not exactly sure why they use the term toll-like, but, but they do. Um, these are examples of pathogen recognition receptors, PRRs. And um, I know you've watched the video because you know how complicated it is. Um, some people have not yet watched it, and I think it's only about a minute and a half long or so. So I was thinking maybe we would just watch it real quick, and I could just say, hey, don't worry about this. Um, try to get this concept, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so I'm going to play it. And um, just remember, this is the white blood cell uh, plasma membrane. This is the inside of the cell in yellow. Here's the outside of the cell in blue. These are those particular protein receptors that have the ability to recognize foreign non-self proteins. Okay. They could be part of the cell, like we saw in the preceding slide, part of that pink bacterium, or it, they could potentially also be chemicals that 
the uh, pathogen is releasing that would warn the cell, hey, there's toxins that we need to address. Okay, so let's just watch the video. Structures on the surfaces of phagocytes called pattern recognition receptors make it possible for the phagocyte to immediately recognize a number of different components of infectious agents referred to as pathogen-associated microbial patterns. Toll-like receptors are a class of pattern recognition receptors that play a critical role in the early innate immune response to invading pathogens. Several different toll-like receptors located in the cell membrane or endosomal membranes of phagocytic cells have been identified. They recognize lipoproteins and lipotychoic acids viral double-stranded RNA, lipopolysaccharide, and bacterial flagellin. So all they're saying here are, here we've got five different toll-like receptors, okay? These first two are looking for lipoproteins and lipotechoic acids that we know are potentially part of the cell wall of certain bacteria. Well, what is TR3 looking at, looking for? Well, it says right here, can it respond to bacteria? No, it can only respond to viral RNA. This fifth one, the pink one, or the purple one here, says flagellin. It's looking for specific structures, flagella associated with bacteria. Can it identify viral components? The answer is no. So just begin to think about the fact that you have a diversity of different kinds of PRRs, in this case, they're called toll-like receptors, that are there to monitor a whole host of possible pathogenic signatures, if you will. You don't need to know the names of all these. Not critical that you know those, but that you have a basic understanding of what, what they do here. Why, why are they there? They're there to recognize the presence of foreign invaders. Let's continue on with the video. Some toll-like receptors exist as monomers, whereas others exist as dimers. When a toll-like receptor interacts with a particular pathogen component, it activates specific cytoplasmic adapter proteins, such as MYD88, MAL, TRIF, and TRAM. This activation initiates a signaling pathway to defend against a specific type of pathogen. Lipopolysaccharide is a pathogen-associated structure produced by gram-negative bacteria. It first binds to lipopolysaccharide binding protein and then associates with a cell surface protein, CD14. The CD14 with bound lipopolysaccharide binding protein then activates TLR4. The activated TLR4 then interacts with and activates specific cytoplasmic proteins. The interaction of TLR4 with these cytoplasmic proteins activates other proteins, allowing them to convert inactive transcriptional activators, such as NF-kappa B, into active forms. The activated NF-kappa B moves into the nucleus and binds to specific sites on DNA. Binding of NF-kappa B to specific sites on DNA induces transcription of genes for cytokines, including interleukins and tumor necrosis factor. These cytokines move out of the phagocyte and stimulate various aspects of both specific and nonspecific immunity. Okay, so you do not need to know all of the jargon that they were talking about here but rather try to get the big picture. And the big picture takeaway message is when these some of these receptors are able to hone in on the presence of foreign proteins, foreign invader molecules, it can set into motion a whole series of cascading events, both within the cytoplasm and ultimately within the nucleus. And they talk about how the, the DNA of the white cell can start to produce these various things called cytokines, and they list them up here. These cytokines 
of which they mention interleukins, but you'll be hearing about different other types too. These are, are secreted from the white cell and they just fire up the troops. They get other, other types of cells informed that there are foreign invaders here. We need to start taking some steps to knock them out. So it's, it's the beginning of priming the system, if you will, priming the body that we have a foreign invader that's here. Let's start communicating and coordinating our efforts to try to get rid of it. But you can see it's complicated. There's a lot of uh, enzymes at work, lots of activation of, of, of uh, um, inactive molecules into active molecules. This notion of of, of, of transcribing particular genes at, at, at different times, right, in response to the pathogen to produce these different chemicals. Um, it's, it's a very, very complex process. But I think it's important you understand that this doesn't happen magically, that it all starts with being able to, number one, recognize the, the, the fact you have a non-self cell or a non-self chemical, we'll call it a pathogenic associated molecule of some sort. It could be on the surface of the cell. It could be a toxin that the cell produces. It's something that tells the, the immune system, the white cell here, we have a foreign invader or we have a foreign substance that could cause us harm. Let's start getting our act together and determining, number one, what is the PAMP? And number two, what can we do to negate its, its ultimate effect, which would be to hurt us? So you do not need to know all of, all of the details and the names of these different factors and all that stuff, no. An appreciation of what they do here is the main takeaway. Thank you, that helps because the video will kind of make your head spin. Yeah, it does. It introduces lots of terms. Um, but um, again, just, just try, to, try to get a flavor for what the video is trying to you know, the essence of what it's trying to say. Uh, and it's hard sometimes to, to do that amid all the technical jargon, I, I, I get that. I think what students just often have a real difficult time with, and, and I, I'm not saying that I didn't as well, because I probably did, is understanding that when we talk about how cells interact, I don't care what cells you talk about, whether it's, you know, white cells and bacteria or, or you know, self cells, all cell interaction involves, you know, protein receptors and interaction um, with other molecules. It, it's, it's all chemistry. It's a lot of chemistry. Um, and then um, you had asked also about the complement system, which is addressed at the very, very end of chapter 14. So I'm going to go right to that, knowing that some of you haven't yet gotten to this yet. Um, let's see, where are we here? Right here. Okay, so first thing to, and this is a very complicated topic too, it can get very technical. Um, Complement can work both in innate immunity and it can also work in what we would define as specific immunity. The difference being innate is protection against all, every and all pathogens, no matter how many times you've been exposed to it, right? And specific or adaptive immunity is is, is targeting a specific pathogen and also building up a memory to that pathogen so that if you're exposed to it later in life, you can knock it out before it makes you sick. Okay. So as it mentions here in the first bullet, this complement system is made up of a whole bunch of different kinds of proteins that are floating around in your bloodstream. And as it mentions here, they're pretty much there to help knock out bacteria and viruses. 
And so the term complement is aptly named because if you look up the word complement in the dictionary, you know, oh, you know, you'll you'll hear about examples of how you know this complements this, or this color complements this color, or this food complements this wine. You know what I'm talking about, right? The term complement. So this is a system that is complementing, it's enhancing, it's making uh, both innate and acquired immune uh, responses um, occur more efficiently, if you will. It helps, complements the immune response. Okay. Well, we just talked about the fact that white cells have these pattern recognition receptors on their, on their cell surface that can identify foreign molecules, right? We just talked about that. So this is like a perfect lead and I didn't even plan it this way. So we're gonna now think of the complement proteins just like the PRRs on the surface of a white cell as having the capability to connect with the foreign molecule, the foreign protein. Okay, so just think of it as like a, a toll-like re toll -like receptor that's floating around all by itself. We call it a complement protein. Okay, so its shape is such that it can recognize different kinds of foreign molecules. Basically, that's what we're talking about. Now that foreign molecule might be on the surface of a bacterial cell, or it could be something that the bacterium secreted, like a toxin maybe. Ultimately, what do we want to do? We want to get rid of the toxin or we want to get rid of the bacterium, right? How does complement protein help do that? Well, there's a number of different ways that this works. And your book um, does describe three different pathways. I am not going to get into those three pathways, but if you look on page 471 of your book, you will see three different colored boxes at the top, a yellow one, an orange one, and a blue one, I think, or purple, right? Well, that's the names of those different pathways. You do not need to know the names, nor do you need to know exactly how these three uh, are, are unique or different from one another. But there are three different pathways that these complement proteins work. We're going to talk about one. And this next slide gets to the heart of, of how um, one of these pathways kind of works. And I think I'm going to just go to this first um, video. So let's let's watch this video and see if we can understand. I'll, I'll pl probably play it two or three times because it really takes a little bit to sink in. Just try to get the the gist of the of the uh, video here, and we'll we'll go back and pause it and talk about it. I'm just going to play it through from front to end, front to back. Regardless of whether the complement system is activated by the classical, alternative, or lectin pathway, the activated complement proteins are involved in several important processes associated with host defenses, including inflammation, attraction of neutrophils, opsonization, and cell lysis. Complement C3A participates in inflammation by inducing changes that cause the walls of local blood vessels to become more permeable. This facilitates movement of phagocytic cells from the circulation into the tissues. Complement 5A induces a directed chemotactic migration of phagocytes to the site of complement activation. Complement C3B functions as an opsonin. It binds to microbial cells, making them more susceptible to phagocytosis. Complement proteins C5B, C6, C7, C8, and C9 react together to form a hole in the cell membrane. When C5 convertase converts C5 into C5A and C5B, the C5B binds to the cell surface 
and combines with C6. C5B6 binds C7, enabling it to insert into the membrane. Binding of C8 is followed by binding of several C9s. The hole generated by formation of this membrane attack complex causes the cell to lyse. Okay, so let's watch this one more time. This sort of gets at what the preceding slide talked about. Okay, so let's go back again and watch this. Regardless of whether the complement system is activated by the classical, alternative, or lectin pathway, the activated complement proteins are involved in several important processes associated with host defenses. Okay, so the letter C simply means complement protein. Okay, that's all that means. There are, uh, again, a number of different uh, proteins, or I think 30 of them we saw in the earlier slide, right? We're just talking about a handful of them here. And within a given, uh, you know, protein, there are subsets, if you will, as you can see here, by 3A and 3B. Um, one such complement, this C3A, is going to be involved in a process called inflammation. This is described in Chapter 14 as a process that helps protect us against foreign invaders. We've all suffered from inflam inflammation or having the inflammatory response occur when we get a sore or a cut and it's then tender to the touch or it hurts or it's or maybe it's red or it's warm. Right? These are all characteristics and symptoms of inflammation. So one reason that you get the, the, the edema, the swelling, the pain, the tenderness um, is due to the fact that you have a likely infection there or some sort of tissue damage anyway. And if it's an infection, which it could possibly be, some inflammation is due to infection, right? Um, we might want to call upon this particular complement protein. Well, what does that do? Well, let's see what that does. Including inflammation, attraction of neutrophils, opsonization, and cell lysis. Complement C3A participates in inflammation by inducing changes that cause the walls of local blood vessels to become more permeable. This facilitates movement of phagocytic cells from the circulation into the tissues. What is that called? The movement of white cells out of the blood into the tissues. Diapedesis. Diapedesis, right, exactly. So diapedesis, the movement of the white cells, as you're going to see here, out from the bloodstream by squeezing between the thin, simple squamous that make up the wall of the capillary, occurs thanks to the action of this C3A complement protein. As it says, it makes these uh, capillary beds more permeable. Now look what's happened. Here's, here's the infection that could, could potentially be setting up as we speak due to the splinter that's stuck in your arm and the bacteria that were introduced with that splinter. Well, we want to get rid of these bacteria, don't we? Well, one way to get rid of the bacteria, of course, is to get white cells up here and to phagocytize them. Well, in order to get them there, you got to get them out of the blood because that's where they're that's where they are 99% of the time, right? White cells are in the bloodstream. Now there are some that are scattered around the body, but the majority of white cells are in the blood. So there's C3A allowing for this permeability and allowing for the diapedesis. Here's another complement protein, C5A. Let's see what it does. Complement 5A induces a directed chemotactic migration of phagocytes to the site of complement activation. Chemotactic, what's that mean? Chemotactic. This gets back to Carolina's question, right? Chemotactic. Plants are positively phototactic. We're talking here about chemotaxis, positive chemotaxis. Positive meaning what? The cell is moving toward the chemical. 
right? And chemo simply means chemical. These cells, these two white cells are being attracted to the chemical. These are the sharks. The C5A is the chum. You follow my analogy? Okay. Complement C3B functions as an opsonin. Here's another complement protein acting as an opsonin. What is an opsonin? And what is opsonization? Okay, that was in the earlier slide. Um, again, I'll, I'll come to a really dumb, silly metaphor or analogy. I have to make up these silly stories in my mind so I can understand and remember what this is. I hope you do the same thing because you've got to do that. You've got to come up with easy to understand examples. Okay, so here's my easy to understand example about C3B. And you're going to laugh at it, but that's fine. I like peanut M&Ms. I like the chocolate around the, the peanut. So the C3B is the chocolate <laughs> that is surrounding the peanut, which is the bacterium. And I am the white cell. I love chocolate covered peanuts. Now, before C3B was introduced, what was the bacterium? To me, as I look at that, it'd be just the peanut, right? But now with the C3B coating it, acting as an opsonin, I'm forming this chocolate coat over the surface of the peanut, meaning I can now gobble that up because I like chocolate covered peanuts. It binds to microbial cells, making them more susceptible to phagocytosis. Complement protein. What this really does is it marks the cell such that these white cells can identify the bacterium as being needed now to be uh, phagocytized. It marks the cell. It, it's, it's labeling the cell um, as a pathogen. That's one, one thing that it can do. C5B, C6. Okay, so here we're talking next about a whole series of complement proteins and how they work in concert with one another to form artificial pores in the cell membrane here of the bacterial cell. Or maybe this is a, a virally infected cell or a cancer cell. C7, C8, and C9 react together to form a hole in the cell membrane. When C5 convertase converts C5 into C5A and C5B, the C5B binds to the cell surface and combines with C6. C5B6 binds C7, enabling it to insert into the membrane. Binding of C8 is followed by binding of several C9s. The hole generated by formation of this membrane attack complex causes the cell to lyse. So notice how this pore was created, right? It started off with, with C5B here, and then we have another one coming in, six, seven, and then a bunch, uh, a one eight and a bunch of C9s. Now, do you need to know the, the numbers here? No, not critical. But you should have some understanding that there is a, a series of um, actions, they call it a cascade, uh, it's somewhat reminiscent of blood clotting. We talk about the cascading effect of, of clotting factors resulting in the formation of the blood clot. Uh, they have to occur in a certain sequence in order to create the clot. Well, in order to create the pore here in the cell membrane of the pathogen, these complements have to come in, these proteins have to come in in a certain sequence. It's all regulated. Uh, I can't explain how, but they, they come in at a certain sequence. They must do that. They must work together, if you will quote unquote, um, to create that attack, to create that attack complex. And then when you start poking holes in cells, the internal contents are going to leak out and the cell is going to die, basically. So um, that would be the extent to which you should know what the complement system kind of does. It gets very, very technical but it is an important process, important uh, uh, 
series of proteins that can assist in the neutralization in the death, right, of a pathogen. But do not get caught up in the, in the technicality. You don't need to know the alternative pathway. You don't need to know the MB lectin pathway. Um, uh, what we've just described is probably best uh, describing the class, what we call the classical pathway. I don't, did, did that help? Hopefully. Yes, it did. Thank you. Okay, good. Um, uh, so Caroline asks, so does diabetes happen all the time and chemotaxis happen when tissue is injured? Um, really, the only time diapedesis would typically occur is if there's the need to have the white cell leave the bloodstream, and that would be uh, when there again is an infection. Um, of some sort. Um, chemotaxis, it, again, is the response um, of, of a usually a tissue damage uh, event, uh, and the injured tissue would release these, these chemicals that would act to encourage diapedesis or certainly encourage phagocytosis. So usually I associate with injured tissue, yes. Okay, good. Um, I think, um, you know, you, looking at the Zoom lecture can help kind of guide you in terms of how much detail um, to know for a given topic um, because we can't possibly cover every single bold-faced term in chapter 14 and 15. I mean, it would take, it, it, you just can't do it. It's too much. Uh, I'm assuming that some of this is review. Now, that's not a fair assumption to make for some of you, I know, because like I say, Hannah hasn't had AMP, but um, you're going to have to learn some of the stuff that these other students have, have already learned, like the five different kinds of white cells. The fact that they all start with stem cells, right, in the bone marrow and differentiate into the present day neutrophils, basophils, eosinophils, monocytes, and lymphocytes. Uh, these, these are two very technical chapters, <clears throat> cover a lot of information. Other, other topics? I, I had made the suggestion of focusing on 14 this week and 15 next week, but certainly we, we can talk about whatever you guys would like. I just figured a lot of you haven't even gotten into 15 and you're just starting to get into 14. But I have don't, a question. Yeah, go ahead, Monica. About interferon. I, I mean, I get it, I guess, <clears throat> that it goes into a healthy cell so that the virus can't replicate once it enters, correct? Yeah, but I couldn't get the videos to open for some reason. One says it doesn't work anymore, and the other one just doesn't work at all for me. Okay. So is there anything in the video we like need to know? Well, let's let's go ahead and see if we can get it to okay. play. Yeah. Um, and and please let me know if you're having trouble um, with some of those. I, and I know sometimes that happens. I I I want you to be able to watch the video. So please tell me. Um, so let's again go back to the PowerPoint and. Um, and here's the video, right? Or the slide, anyway, that Monica was referring to. Yeah, the YouTube one says that the user doesn't exist anymore or something. And then the holes oh. won't open at all for me for some well, reason. Well, that's weird. I just played this the other day and it worked. I, that's bizarre. Okay, why is this not pulling up? What the heck? Hang on a minute. Let me try something. I don't know, my system's acting weird after we boot the PowerPoint. The other thing that you should try to do, although I don't know how helpful it would be, would be to kind of do a quick search, YouTube search, and see if you can find the same video. Um, 
Although if you don't know what you're looking for, it's going to be helpful. Okay, let's try this. Um, okay, everybody got the interferon slide there? Yeah. Okay, so let's... Um, is this going to let me do this? Click on this. Why is this not letting me do this? All right, I'll try something else. Hang on a minute here. I'm having a hard time getting it to play. I don't know. Because I'm in Zoom, it's not acting like it normally does here for me. Um, I don't know why it's not. I mean, I put a box around this the other day, but I was playing before. I don't know what the heck happened. I don't know. I'm I'm going to have to investigate this. I'm not coming up with a quick fix. Um, if you just search YouTube and type in interferon, in fact, we could try it here. Maybe I can get it to work this way. It's on YouTube at least. That's where I I pulled it. It's a video that I used to use in A and P, and unless I have, uh, let me show this better. Unless I have the flash drive in my computer, I don't think you guys can access it. So I went on YouTube to find the same video, thinking I'll just provide them with a different link. It's the same video, and it, and that's what I did, and it worked, but. Now I'm not going to be able to find it quickly. Um, Okay. This I think maybe I fixed it. Because I put a box around it, it seemed like it prevented it from playing. So here's the video I'm going to share with you now. Everybody see the video? Yeah. Okay. When a cell is infected by a virus, the virus enters the cell and produces structures that are not found in uninfected cells. The presence of this viral material signals the cell to produce interferon. The interferon moves out of the cell and attaches to receptors on nearby cells of the same type. The cell that produces the interferon is unable to save itself. The virus replicates in the cell and then moves out to infect nearby cells. The nearby cell that already has interferon bound to its surface responds in several ways, 
including production of enzymes that degrade messenger RNA and prevent protein synthesis. Thus, a virus can attach and enter the cell, but completion of the viral replication cycle is prevented. Okay, so let's watch that one more time. And, and you, sh you should be able to play this now. Uh, I'll, I'll save the latest version of the PowerPoint and hopefully you can play it. So this is obviously, a, a, looks like a naked um, virus coming in, right? Docking with the cell, the first cell, whole cell. It's allowed in. And this cell is going to do what it's told, right? It's going to be given the instruction booklet to make more viral protein and more viral nucleic acid, like all viruses tell cells to do, right? We've talked about that a million times. But this cell has a trick up its sleeve. In response to having been invaded by a virus, it all pro also produces this chemical called interferon. And it secretes this, as it will be doing shortly. And as it says, this interferon will dock with certain receptors of another self cell, part of the body cell, another possible uh, target, right, that these bacteria might want to get to. Well, fine, this first cell, you know, it's, it's going to die. It's going to make viruses as it's doing here. It's, it can't do anything, but it did do something. It produced the interferon that's going to tell this cell hey, you have an invader coming, and that invader might even get in, right, like this, but we're going to prevent it from uh, causing this cell to make more copies of more viruses because we're not going to let that, that messenger RNA be transcribed, uh, you know, or I'm sorry, not going to let it be um, utilized in translation to make more viral protein. And if you don't make more viral protein, can you make viruses? The answer is no. So this cell is not going to turn into a viral factory, is it? Because of the fact that it had the interferon that it got from its close cousin that, that did act as a viral factory. But you're, 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 you're nipping it in the bud, aren't you? You're preventing um, the viral infection from continuing. That's the whole idea. And these tend to target, um, as I mentioned here, virally infected cells um, and also, I think, cancer cells, too. Yeah. It's an immune enhancer. And there's different kinds of interferon. We're not going to get into the alpha, beta, gamma types. Um, but they basically prevent further viral or um, cancer cell development in essence. OK, so um, if you haven't gotten into chapter 14, definitely make that a goal by the end of the week, really. And um, well, you've got the quiz on Thursday, right? Um, we only have really nine days left. So it's it's really coming to the end really, really, really fast. It always does. So hang in there. You know, I know I know you're busy with other classes and you're working and you have other obligations, but you've made it this far. You're only a week left. So just hang in there. Any last minute questions? So the quiz will be the normal time that we've set up, 1.15 to 2.30, unless uh, you and I have made up alternate arrangements, with I which I have with some people. But unless you've talked with me, it's, it's 1.15 to 2.30. It's always been that way. All righty. I have I have one question. Okay. It's, it's not even a, about like specifically something. I'm just I'm just nervous about my grade because I'm graduating. I just want to okay. make sure my grades okay. If I could ask you that. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Okay. I tell you what. Um, I'm going to close this and I'm going to. Uh, I need to download the recording to the Zoom website. But let's okay. reconvene. Let's reconvene in like. 
two minutes on the same okay. Zoom room, okay? Yes, thank you. Sure. Bye.